Good evening. How is everyone? Great. Yes. <laughs> Welcome to our in-person and virtual audiences this evening. I'm Stephen Davey. I'm the senior producer here at WBUR City Space. What a beautiful crowd we have tonight. Thank you all for coming. Before we get started, I do want to do a little plug, as is want to do, beginning of a show. Uh, we have a great new newsletter from our environment team. It's called Cooked, and it's all about the search for sustainable eats and how you can reduce your impact on climate change. It's also funny and loaded with food puns. Highly recommended. All written by our reporter, Barbara Moran. And since you're here, we thought you all might be interested in a little giveaway. So I have a copy of Miyoko Shinner's The Vegan Meat Cookbook. Voila. And we're giving it away. Th to get this beautiful book filled with really inspiring recipes, and I've been looking at it all week, trust me, head to Slido right now, sli.do, with the code cuisine. And just add your name and email, and you'll be signing up for our cook newsletter. Don't worry, it's good, and you won't regret it. Um, also, we'll do a little shuffle of the names and announce a winner at the end for a free signed copy. And I should mention, in this book is a recipe for meaty, smoky chili, which will be available to taste after this conversation tonight in the lobby prepared for us by our partners at uh, Boston University's Food and Wine Program. What a perfect night for chili, just cold enough, right? Um, so get your phones, sign up for Cooked, and win this cookbook. Okay, now, did you all try some of Miyoko's cheeses? Yes. 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 Favorites? Go ahead, what is it? Who has a favorite? Garlic. Truffle, garlic? Yeah. Okay, all right, mixed crowd here, good, good. Very tasty. Um, Miyoko Shinner has changed the world, how the world thinks about vegan cheese, wouldn't you say? If it, uh, it wasn't that many years ago when you went to a grocery store here in Boston uh, in search of vegan cheese and got plasticky, rubbery, imitations of craft singles. Okay, so in my opinion, not the best op options for uh, vegan cheese. Then something happened. Miyoko happened, flavor happened, and vegan cheese has never been the same. The entire cheese category has never been the same. Miyoko is the CEO and founder of California-based Miyoko's Creamery. You probably already know that, which is why you're here. From cheese wheels perfect for your next party spread to bubbling mozzarella. Have you tried that? That's pretty awesome as well. Miyoko's Creamery has basically invented the artisanal category of plant-based cheese and butter. And as you will hear, food is a form of activism and community. Welcome. Uh, Miyoko is truly an important voice for our world right now. Guiding us on this culinary journey tonight with Miyoko is WBUR Endless Thread co-host and senior producer, Emery Sievertson. Now, please welcome Emery and Miyoko Shinner. Okay, let me get my Beyonce piece on, one second. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'll get the microphone, too. There we go. Ha-ha. Uh -huh. um, so how many, just out of a show of hands, how many people here are vegan? Oh, hell yeah. OK. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right. <laughs> Give it up <laughs> for yourselves. How many people are vegetarian? Any vegetarians in the house? Hell yeah. How many people are lactose intolerant? <laughs> hell yeah. How many people are confused and just saw cheese in the name of the event and are now like... <laughs> That's a very like, good oh, reason. Yeah, <laughs> that is a good reason. Well, um, well, welcome, one and all. You've now had a chance to taste Miyoko's cheese if you haven't had it before. Um, does anyone want to shout out a favorite that they tasted in the lobby? Oh, yeah, so good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the smoked mozzarella is a favorite in my household. I was telling Miyoko earlier about a way that I use the mozzarella, which we don't have time for that right now, but you can ask me after. Oh, come on. We always have time to talk about, you know, combinations <sighs> like that. We were talking about rubbing a little garlic on your toast. and Yeah, I make caprese toast caprese with her smoked toast. mozzarella. 
And so, yeah, she taught me about rubbing the raw garlic on the toast, which you're nodding. You knew that already, apparently, which good for you. I did not, but my toast will never be the same. Um, so this event, the subtitle of it, Miyoko, was the, the vegan cheese revolution, which we're, I think we're definitely in the midst of. But I think we're also, I'm feeling at least like we are in the midst of a, a food revolution more generally. And um, I think you have some thoughts about that. Where, where do you think we are right now and where do you think we are hopefully going? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is, if you just look at it historically, we are at a point in history, first time ever, where humankind has actually really thought about their food choices because it impacts everything. What we eat impacts whether or not we're gonna survive as a species. And so we've come to a point where we actually have choices. For most of human history, we never really thought about what food we, you know, we didn't have a choice. We didn't say, oh, I feel like having Chinese tonight. You ate whatever was around you, whatever was in season, whatever your culture ate, that's what you ate and you never thought about it. So this is the first time in history where we're actually thinking about food and its impact, not only on human health, but on the health of everything else as well as the animals. So we have an opportunity. We have a, not only an opportunity, but a huge responsibility to think about what is the future we want to create for ourselves, for our children, for our grandchildren? How can we design a new food system that will help maintain this planet? and all of its inhabitants, not just humans, but all of the other animals with whom we share the space. How can we do that? So this is a huge opportunity because we have an opportunity to actually think about it now. We've never had that in human history, but at the same time, it's a responsibility that we have to live up to. Here, here. Miyoko came fired up and ready to go. I don't know if you guys... <laughs> We're aware of that, but we all need to get on her level right now. And you can, because we are gonna be taking some of your questions throughout this conversation. So um, maybe Stephen already said this, but it's slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com on your phones. It's gonna ask you to enter a event code, which is just the word cuisine, all lowercase. I don't know if it matters if it's lowercase or capitalized, but if you have questions, it does not matter, I'm told, thank you. Um, if you have questions, I'll be looking at my little cheat screen here throughout to make sure that we can get some of those in. Um, okay, great, that was great. So every, I think everyone in here has a relationship to food based on what we grew up eating, the culture that we grew up in. Can you give us kind of the quick tour of your journey with food? Growing up in a, you know, outside of Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. To you know, where you are now. Absolutely. I was just telling uh, a couple of friends that are sitting right there in the front audience there. Hey, friends. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, the little village that I grew up in outside of Tokyo, about 30 minutes outside of Tokyo, I literally lived right next to a rice paddy. And uh, that village had one car owned by the fishmonger, a three wheel vi vehicle. And, you know, I ate rice and I don't know. I, fish and tofu and miso soup and, and just very simple things. And I remember this really special day when my mother said, we're going to go eat something really special. And we got all dressed up and instead of taking a train, we took a taxi. And we went to a department store and in the department store was a fancy restaurant and I sat there properly, I was probably like, I don't know, five or six years old. And out came this little parfait bowl with one perfect scoop of vanilla ice cream. And that was my very first experience with vanilla ice, with ice cream. And I tasted it and I thought I was tra had been transported to heaven. <laughs> I thought, what is this magical food? So, I mean, this is how I grew up. I grew up eating just a vastly different diet. And then I moved to the United States when I was seven years old, went to public school, had to start drinking milk, uh, which, you know, in, in Japan, we didn't consume. And now it's actually part of the, I don't know, the, the, the food, what the equivalent to the food pyramid or whatever it is that they have in Japan. Like you're supposed to drink milk now. Um, but you know, it's, it was not a, a food that was consumed in most of Asia for most of hi history. Um, so I, that's how I grew up eating. And then um, when I was about eight years old, I had cheese for the first time at a party where I had pizza. 
and I thought that was the most disgusting thing I'd ever had <laughs> in my life. As the oil dripped down my mouth and down my throat, and I practically choked, I thought, mm, how can people eat this stuff? I was just, dis I was grossed out. Uh, but of course, you know, I worked very, very hard at loving cheese, and, and hence, uh, well, where I am right now. But, but I still prefer, to be honest, I'm, I'm back to, now that I've figured out the cheese thing, I, I'm kind of back to eating rice. <laughs> So. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So um, you you had like a French food detour, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was Which is you know, cheese heavy. I, I, I became cream. a vegetarian when I was 12. And uh, so at that time, you know, there, there were no guides. This is back in the 60s, actually. So there were no guides on how to be vegan or vegetarian or how how to get your nutrients. So there was one nutrition writer whose name I can't remember, but everybody read her. And I thought I had to eat a lot of dairy products as a vegetarian. So I did. I learned how to love dairy products. And then that went on to discovering the Time Life series that my parents had in their house. You have the Time Life series too? <sighs> I read the whole me too. Yes, me too. Every single page. And even the... Oh my God! I have Gr no idea great, what a great series, about. and I, I tried to make, I like, I learned all these techniques, whether it was about meat or dairy. I learned these techniques from that, and then I was turned on to Julia Child, mm. and I read, I, I did the same thing. I went through mastering the art of French cooking, and I tried to vegetarianize it, and then I tried to veganize it when I went vegan in uh, the 1980s. Mm. Um, and that was really just, you know, it was like I had just fallen in love. I was living, I was back living in Tokyo. And Tokyo, people, unbeknownst to most people, Tokyo has more French, I'm sorry, more Michelin starred restaurants than all of France. Hmm. So in my na neighborhood, in my little neighborhood in Tokyo, within like a five minute walking radius, there were probably four or five French restaurants. So I frequented them uh, because, you know, I, I always order something vegetarian, which meant lots of butter and lots of cheese. Yeah. And then when I went vegan, I had to figure out, how do I do this? How can I satisfy those rich, unctuous, you know, flavors, but from a vegan alternative? Hmm. So you, you have been vegan for more than 30 years at this point, and you went vegan before it was cool, before it was convenient, before it seemed possible. So what were the options and what was your plan to kind of build the world that you wanted to eat? Okay, well, the options, this is the thing that's really weird, is that we all forget that we're on a continuum of time. And we think that whatever generation we live in right now is the way we've always done things. And we think, you know, the way Americans have eaten forever are burgers and french fries, and it simply isn't true. And so the Japanese had forgotten that for 800 years, Japan was basically a vegan country by royal decree because it was a Buddhist country, and there was a very, very uh, religious emperor, I don't know, I think in the 12th century or something like that, and basically just uh, had this, this, created this law that you were not allowed to kill or eat any four-legged creatures. Um, and uh, actually, you weren't allowed to eat any flesh whatsoever. And of course, people didn't drink dairy, and so you just had to talk about not eating flesh. Um, now, people weren't entirely vegan. People did eat, they, they did fish, or they would, you know, uh, they would catch birds and eat them. But for the most part, uh, people couldn't afford animal foods very often, and so they were largely a vegan country. But the Japanese have forgotten that. The idea of even vegetarianism at the time in the 1980s was like a shock to most people. And it was very hard even to be a vegetarian because everything had fish stock in it. So if, mm -hmm. you, know, if you went to, if you just wanted to get a bowl of you know, soba noodles, the soba noodles might be vegan and you know, what they put on it, the tofu or the wakame or whatever, but the broth always had fish stock in it. So it was really, really hard to be vegan outside of the home uh, in Tokyo at that time. Um, but, you know, I started these series of dinners on Friday nights, and I would invite random people who would invite 
more random people who would invite more random people. And I would have these 12 course tasting menus every Friday night in my house. And I, I just started doing it because I had to figure out how do I make these things? How can I make a really amazing dinner experience? And um, one thing led to another and it ended up people started bringing people that they knew that were in the food business or that were journalists or whatever. And I got a little bit of notoriety in Japan back in the 1980s and when I was in my 20s. And um, it led to uh, a, a sort of a professional uh, career uh, teaching cooking classes and department stores and cooking schools as well as uh, working with a natural food company designing menus. And, and then I was going to open a restaurant um, and this is uh, and I met this guy that was going to, he owned a bunch of restaurants and we were going to open a restaurant together. And then it turned out he was connected with a Yakuza. <laughs> and my life became miserable. So I got out of Dodge and I came back to the United States wow. before I signed my life away. Wow. So we think of you, I think of you as the queen of vegan cheese. Um, but you've had, there are many in the greatest hits, in the album of Miyoko greatest hits, there was a pound cake at one point that you became very well known for? I don't Maybe it was my backpack that I, so. Okay. I, my first business was a vegan pound cake business in Tokyo, and I didn't have a car, but I had a backpack, and I could fit 71 pound, pound cakes in my backpack. And so I delivered them by subway train all over Tokyo. Wow. I don't know what that feels like, 70 pounds on one's back. You had un-turkey. Yeah. Yep. This, this yep. was a, a holiday feast, a seitan thing with um, crispy yuba skin on it, which, did you still make that anytime? Oh, I make it every Thanksgiving. All right, you're invited yes. over okay. if you, uh, the invitation stands. Um, how did you, you had a cookie too that United Airlines picked up, yes, right? that's right. I had, I sold cookies to United Airlines for 10 years. The uh, more it was served on the vegan, low fat, and I know they had, you know, when they used to serve food before 9-11. Yeah. But, so how did you land on cheese, ultimately? Not that you are not capable of so much more, but how did cheese become the focus for you? Well, um, so that was always the last hurdle. That was like always on my bucket list of things to create because it was the thing that gave me the hardest, you know, for me when I went vegan, I, it wasn't like I, had a, I have a vegan, how many of you have like vegan anniversaries and you like, you know the date that yeah, you- Yeah, okay. I do. Well, I don't. I don't because <laughs> it was more gradual for me because, you know, living in Japan, not being able to eat out, um, occasionally I would eat cheese. And occasionally if I went to a party and there was some brie, I'd make sure that the vegan police weren't around and I'd steal some. <laughs> but, so, you know, cheese was really like for most people, it was really, really hard to give up. And as we know, it's actually physically addicting because of casomorphine. It's not just, it's biologically addicting. So, um, I finally just figured out, okay, I can live without cheese. I can. I, I really like having little appetizers. When you have a glass of wine, I want to have that spread of little nibbles that are elegant and beautiful and, and delicious. And so I just figured out I can make all these other appetizers without cheese, and I may do for a long time. And then um, one day, soon my soon-to-be ex-husband um, came home. Uh, we were having a Christmas party that night. And he came home with this huge bag of cheese that he had bought from local cheesemakers. He said, my guests expect cheese when they come to a party. And I was like, okay, you deal with it. Um, I don't want to put it out. And that actually gave me the impetus. Like next year, the following Christmas party, I was determined not to serve animal dairy cheese. So this was in the early 2000s, and I just sort of, immersed myself in learning about cheese making. I read um, cheese making books. I took a cheese making course at the local junior college. I was the only vegan in there who didn't actually eat anything. I just wanted to know how it all worked. Wow. Um, and then I just you know, started exploring um, fermenting plant milks and figuring out you know, how do these plant milks behave when they're fermented, when you add different enzyme, your yeast or molds or Bacteria, what happens biologically? Uh, what works, what doesn't work? Um, this is, you know, if you th think about it, there's been over 2,000 years of history, 2,000 years of experience by millions of people making dairy, uh, animal dairy cheese. 
but we really don't understand plant milk fermentation. We've only been doing it for you know, less than two decades, maybe a decade. Um, and so, and I would say, you know, if, if I was one of the earlier ones, then the fact that it's getting out there now to more and more people around the world, um, it's still a very, very new thing. So we just don't understand, like, what happens if you make milk out of fava beans and then you add certain bacteria to it? And which bacteria? There's thousands of bacteria. If you go to these culture houses, you can buy all of these different types of bacteria that and if you take the same if you take the same milk and you add different bacteria to let's say 20 samples of it, you get tw you can get 20 different flavors. Hmm. So, you know, this is just we're just at the precipice of really this whole new exploration into uh, the new wave of cheese making, I believe. I'm seeing as how many people raised their hands saying that they were vegan, I'm sure that you also have heard this question, but I feel like a, a question that I get a lot from people when I say that I'm vegan is just like, uh, yeah, I could just never give up real cheese. Well, it is real cheese. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's, I that's what I wanted to know yeah, is what, that, what, how do you answer that it. question? Okay, so the way I look at it is, okay, there's... Or if people just say they could never give up dairy cheese or I don't, I don't well, know. Well, it is how dairy you, cheese. So this is the way I look at it. It's about language. Language has to evolve. Food culture evolves and language has to evolve to reflect that. And that's why, you know, I sued the state of California when they told us that we couldn't use the term butter because I felt like that was a First Amendment case and we won. So the way I look at it is, uh, the concept of dairy, everybody knows what milk is. The word for milk is not owned by the animal dairy industry. The word milk is used in many, many cultures in their languages to represent milky substances. Soy milk in Japanese is tonu. Nu is the word for milk. And it's the same thing for bonu, which means mother's milk. So it's the same character, it's the same word. And it's the same in many, many other languages. So it's not like animal agriculture has ownership over the term milk. Anything that is milky, white, cultures all over the world historically have called milk. So why don't we redefine the term dairy to encompass milk that comes from either animals or plants? So that's the way I look at it. We just need to evolve the language to reflect cultural customs worldwide. And, you know, I also find it, to be honest, I don't want to get on my racist um, soapbox here, but, you know, when I get into these arguments sometimes and people say, well, you know, you, um, you know milk is only that of lacteal secretions of, um, of one or more healthy cows, which is how the FDA defines it, by the way, if you look there. Uh, I think it's um, defined by one or, it's the lacteal secretions of one or, lacteal secretions from one or more healthy cows free of colostrum, blah, blah, blah. That's how milk is defined, and butter hmm. and cheese. It's kind of gross, but anyway. Um, you know, I think because so many cultures use the same word, you can't deny other cultures the right to use such terminology just because Americans don't want to. Um, and so, you know, it's really about creating equity in language as well. Um, so I, I, was, I think we need to evolve language and we need to, in order to evolve the language, we have to use this language. I am against using words like alt dairy or dairy alternative or dairy free or um, because it's not dairy free. For me, it's plant dairy. Hmm. That's how I define it. It's not a dairy alternative. It is dairy. It's just dairy made from plants. So another, we were talking in the green room before and I was telling Miyoki, Miyoko about how uh, it kind of bugs me when someone says like, try this, you'll never know it's vegan. And I'm guilty of doing that too. But that's another, just thinking about language, it's like, it, it, when I accidentally say that, it's like I'm saying that vegan things are usually not as good as non-vegan things. And so I catch myself doing it. And I, I think you're right that language matters and how we talk about our food choices 
matters. And um, another another kind of in the world of semantics, another thing that you have I've heard you voice an opinion about is plant based versus vegan. And you see this in, in the grocery store now with products that some things choose to call themselves plant-based and other products say this is vegan. Well, Miyoko's. Miyoko says vegan creamery or vegan cheese on it. So what what's your thinking on that? You know, once again, we have to decide what's the future we want to create. Do we want to create a future that's based on fear of the past? The argument I hear all the time is people say, I don't want to use the word vegan, it has a lot of baggage. Well, it might have had a lot of baggage, and if you want to maintain that, that attitude that lives in fear of the past, then we're going to maintain that. Or you can just decide that it's going to be phenomenally vegan, <laughs> and you can make vegan sexy. I mean, the way, I, you know, it's like, it's like, you remember the electric car? There was a movie called Who Killed the Electric Car? So General Motors had an electric car, and it, honestly, it just wasn't that sexy. And then Elon Musk came along for whatever you think about Elon, I have opinions too, but he comes along and he decides he's gonna make a sexy electric car. That changed how people looked at electric vehicles. And so we have to do the same thing. If we want people to think about veganism as something that is aspirational, that's exciting, that's phenomenal, that's better than what we're doing today, we have to bring that energy to it. We have to give people FOMO. We have to go, oh my God, you're not vegan. Oh, you are so missing out. It is so exciting. It is so wonderful. Everything tastes so much better. You'll feel better and you'll save the world. You become a superhero overnight. Like we have to create the future that we want to believe in or that we do believe in. Otherwise we're, you know, it, we can either inspire people or we can live in fear. And so that's a decision that we have to make. Here, here. Do you feel the little fire starting under your butts? <laughs> yep, I feel it too. Uh, we have an audience question, which is a good reminder out there that you all can put in your audience questions. Slido.com. Cuisine is the code, yeah? Cuisine. Okay, so here's one from the audience. Um, Miyoko, how do, you feel, uh, how do you feel the accessibility of vegan foods is to communities, people... I'm sorry, I'm doing a bad job with English right now. Uh, I, the, I, the, how do you feel the accessibility of vegan foods is to communities of people struggling financially? It's, it's not very good. Um, and so, you know, this is the odd thing. Um, for most of humankind, people that didn't have resources ate mostly a vegan diet. But what we've done is we've forgotten how to cook, and in certain communities, there are no options for food that you can actually cook with. You, all, you know, what we've done, I mean, if, there's an excellent movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend They're Trying to Kill Us. Um, and there is inherent racism in the food system today, in industrialized agriculture, in the foods that we provide certain people that don't have resources. Um, I used to live in this area in San Francisco called the Bayview, which was, uh, was an underserved neighborhood, and there was no transportation there. And this, I had a restaurant in San Francisco in near Japantown, but I lived in the Bayview. And you know, I had the, uh, I had, I had a car, and so I go to Whole Foods and I go shopping. And I remember my neighbor coming over one day, and she saw like the bounty of vegetables on my table, and she goes, "Oh my God, where did you get that?" Because the only thing we had in our neighborhood was a liquor store that sold diapers and milk. Otherwise, it was you know Kentucky Fried Chicken or McDonald's or, uh, and so th there's just like. We have to overhaul the food system. It's a huge, it's a huge, huge ordeal. And there are people that are working to bring healthy earth foods into uh, communities uh, that are underserved. So, I mean, that is happening, but it's not enough. And, you know, there has to be a total overhaul of the school lunch program, the USDA's dietary guidelines, uh, the SNAP program, all of these things that basically, uh, basically, um, get rid of cheap food and dump it on communities of color. I mean, I don't know, there's like 1.4 billion piles of cheese stockpiled in US government coffers to dump on through the school lunch program, the SNAP program, and you know, just, it's, it's an unfair system. And there is not equal access to food. And that's a huge problem. I'm not sure that's something I 
can tackle, but there are, are a lot of people working on it, and this is something that is going to have to change. Um, because, and, and then, you know, the other issue is like people say, well, why are vegan products so expensive? It's not affordable, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. One, we don't receive subsidies from the government, whereas meat and dairy do. Um, so it's reflecting the true cost of production. And I can tell you that most vegan companies aren't profitable because um, it, it's costs, it costs more to make sometimes than it does to, to sell it. Um, I mean, ideally, you know, you do become, these companies do become profitable, but it's, it's a long road. Um, and there's not, it's a very short history since these companies have, you know, have come to be. So there's a lot of work there, but you know what? There, we do have, I think more importantly, rather than focusing on the products that are in the stores, we have to teach people how to cook. We have to get people back into the kitchen because a beautifully prepared plate of lentils can be absolutely delicious, inexpensive, and oh so nourishing. And we have, to, I mean, you can eat cheaper. There was a study that was done that showed that you can actually eat cheaper on a vegan diet. But we have to give people the tools for cooking for ac and provide them access to these foods. We should also point out that before you created Miyoko's Creamery, before Miyoko's Creamery at least was what it is today, you, you published a cookbook called Artisan Vegan Cheese. Like you gave people the I, keys that's to the right. castle. There is, and, and there's a lot more. I mean, I've learned a lot since I wrote that book, obviously, and you know, I have all these new approaches to making cheese since then. But um, yeah, there's a book out there. And you know, there's also uh, recipes for making cheese in the vegan meat cookbook. In fact, you told me you made the buffalo mozzarella. I did, and you can too. It was easy, it was fun. I had everything already in my house, which was amazing to make it. So you don't, you know, you're not, it, it just, it's great. And it turned out really well. And I told, I said to my husband, I said, if it turns out well, I'm going to tell her if I screw this up, she'll never need to know that I attempted the <laughs> buffalo mozzarella. Um, but it's easy and delicious and you should make it tonight, tomorrow, whenever you want, all the time. Um, so there's another question here from Slido that I had my own version of. So thank you someone for reading my mind. But, you know, I, I think I first primarily went vegan myself more for um, the animals, and then it was like for the environment. And when people ask me that question, I find it impossible to articulate my full feelings without sounding um, preachy, holier than thou. It's just It just feels like a fine line, and I'm wondering how you personally walk it. Oftentimes I don't say anything. I invite people over for dinner. And I mm. do it a lot. I mean, I, I haven't done it as much in the last couple of years because of the pandemic, but you know, I'm, I'm constantly cooking for people. And I live in this community in a little town. I have a farmed animal sanctuary, so I'm out in the country. I'm in um, ag land. So I'm surrounded by ranches, farmers, and as well as equestrian centers. And I'm part of the Ladies Auxiliary which is this little group. <laughs> Do you have we hats? Not, no, we don't. You should have hats. It sounds okay. like we, something where you should have hats. We should have hats. Yeah. Well, we do have tea parties and we do get dressed up for that. But, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a ladies group um, that supposedly uh, helps fundraise for the, the local fire department, for the volunteer fire department, but it's really just an excuse to get together and have wine. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, they, these rancher f women have asked me to do cooking classes on several occasions, and I've had them over to my house, and we had these phenomenally vegan tattoos, and they all put them on one time, and, you know, it's just a matter of, like, how you approach it. Keep it light. You know, levity is really important, and keep it delicious. And remember that food comes from the heart. Food is something that, and that's something we just don't do enough of. Conviviality is one of the most important things that we need to resurrect in this culture for, for humankind, for our species not to fall apart because we eat alone too often. We eat in front of our computers. We think of food as chicken nuggets or a hamburger. You can eat it in your car. You can drive through something and you, you don't ever have to look at someone and talk to them and engage in conversation. And we need to go back to the time when you actually broke bread and had a conversation with someone across the dinner table for a long time. You know, they still do that in certain cultures like Italy. And we need to do more of that here because that's how society stays together. And it's a sharing, it's an experience. We're sharing food, we're sharing conversation, we're sharing hearts. And when you can do that, you open 
up their hearts. I always say, you know that adage, um, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Okay, that's stupid. The way to people's hearts is through their stomachs. It really is true. When you can make delicious food and you're show, giving it to them as an act of love, whether it's through at a potluck or in your own home, and I encourage you to invite people if you can, because that is the greatest act of love and sharing. You change hearts, and people are much more respect, res, receptive to hearing about veganism. I think that's brilliant. Um, a quick follow-up, just because if anyone else is like me and is used to seeing the, the picture of Miyoko in like Veg News or the press pictures where she's flexing and showing. It's real. Yes. Was anyone else like, I wonder if it's real? It's real. Um, so someone asked, someone in the audience asked, can you, can you tell us about your tattoo? When did you, someone says, what does it mean? Well, it says phenomenally vegan. Yeah. And uh, so our, at the time, our, you know, a good friend of mine who was our uh, chief brand officer came up with this phrase, and I just thought it was brilliant because for me, it represents veganism as something that's aspirational, something that you want to try to achieve rather than, you know, it should not be a sacrifice. Like somebody, some, I just got an interview, somebody sent me an interview question for some magazine. They said, what do you miss the most about you know, since you've gone vegan, what do you miss the most? I'm like, I don't miss anything. I've gained everything. Um, I have so much more than when I wasn't vegan. And that's the attitude that we have to carry. We have to show that veganism is exciting, it's sexy, it's phenomenal. So anyway, so th the phrase really, really resonated with me. And when I turned, uh, I've always been anti-tattoo because I was raised a proper Japanese lady. And in Japan, you don't get tattoos, in fact, I can never go to a, a hot spring again in Japan. They would wow. not allow me no tattoos at hot springs, seriously, or a public bath. That's what you miss the most. I, that, yeah, <laughs> that, that, well, I can put it, I can probably cover this with a bandage because traditionally the, um, only Yakuza got tattoos in Japan. So, but anyway, I turned 60 and I thought, what a way to celebrate my birthday if I, so I found a local uh, vegan tattoo artist and I got this tattooed on my arm, and I did it on Facebook Live. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's just say it only took like an hour or so. Let's just say it wasn't as bad as childbirth, but <laughs> I, I haven't gotten any more tattoos since. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I was just thrilled to know that it was real after all this time. So you mentioned the, the farm animal sanctuary, Rancho Compassion. How did that you're so busy. How did you have time to, to start a farm animal ranch? So about seven years ago, seven and a half years ago, we moved out like 15 minutes away from where we were living in the Burbs and moved out to this beautiful area. We had heard about this, this house that was a kind of a fire sale and um, it was beautiful and we wanted to be in a peaceful area. So we moved out there and there was a barn. And about a month later, a friend of mine called me up and she said, Animal Place, which is another sanctuary, has just ha just has these two goats, and they can't they can't keep them. Can you just you know just keep them for a while? So these two little six month old goats, Rufus and Reggie, came, and I fell in love with them. I mean, they were like little they were like dogs with horns. I took them on hiking trips. They went hiking with me with the dogs, <laughs> and they followed me around the house, and they were so curious, and. Um, I, I absolutely just fell in love with him. And then about a month later, a friend of mine called me and said, oh, I knew this man, he just died. And he had, turned out he had three pot belly pigs. So, so they, they showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, Curly. And, and then Mo. it was all over from there. It was like, <laughs> uh, so anyway, yeah. So we ended up having uh, just like, I don't know what happens. Like people hear you have a barn, next thing you know, animals start arriving. <laughs> um, but we're, you know, we're a real sanctuary now, 501c3 nonprofit, and we have staff and volunteers, and we have about 100 animals and um, visitation. Um, but it's really, we, we're trying to be more than just a sanctuary um, for a, a rescue. So we do a lot of outreach, we do a lot of um, education, and we do a lot of events. We just put on uh, a big event called the Mindful Eating Film and Food Festival. Um, and so we had, it was a two-day event with a premiere with, um, and where we did the West Coast premiere of a movie called The Smell of Money. 
fact is about uh, pig farming in, in North Carolina and its impact on communities of color. Um, and then um, the next day was like a veg fest. And you know we're trying to reach people beyond vegans. We want people to come and see these movies and learn about uh, animal agriculture and veganism and all of that. So we, we're really sort of a, a very outreach oriented activist sanctuary. And um, you started to tell me a story earlier about two heroic goats. And I said, no, 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 don't tell me. I want to find out with the rest of the audience. Ah. So um, the, tell us, please, okay. the this story of the goats. This is one of my, my favorite stories. So it actually starts out with a, a, a cleft palate goat named Madeline, um, who was never supposed, to, according to doctors, shouldn't have made it past a few months. And she's about three and a half now. But she got very sick one time. And she got this strange illness. And she was in and out of... UC Davis, and no one knew what was wrong with her. And I should let you know, they don't know because if there is a, a sick animal when they're born, they're usually killed right away. And so veterinarians that take the food animal route don't know about a lot of illnesses that occur if an animal is, a lot, is treated and allowed to grow up. So anyway, Madeline had just recovered. And to prove to everyone that she had recovered from this... this uh, you know, this almost death experience, she became a very feisty goat. And she started, she would like just attack you for no reason occasionally. And you just never knew when she was going to do that. So I went on a hike with the goats and we were up on this hillside and there was a deep ridge and Madeline just decided to go berserk. And she started like, she was up on her hind leg, they get up like this and she was coming down on me. And normally if I said no, she would stop. But she would not stop at all. And she was going full force and I was getting closer and closer to the, the cliff. And I thought, I mean, I, this is the only time in my life I ever thought I was really, I really felt like I was in danger. I really felt this is it, I'm gonna die. Um, all of a sudden out of the blue, these two gentlemen showed up flanked my sides and chased off Madeline. And those two gentlemen were Rufus and Reggie, the original <laughs> goats that, that came to Rancho Compasión. Wow. They were way on top of the hill somewhere. When they saw me screaming and me in danger, they came running down to rescue me. And when I hiked back down the hill, they, they were by my side the entire time. So when people say animals are stupid, Goats are stupid, they just want to eat and sleep. No. They're just as smart as you and me. And you just have to learn to listen. You have to give them attention and treat them with respect. And they will respect you back. They will love you back. So anyway, there, I mean, I've got a million other animal stories of heroic animals. But this was, you know, probably the one where that really touched me because I really did feel I was, I was going to be a goner. Hmm. Um, another question from the audience, slido.com, cuisine, you guys know what to do. Yes, great. Um, why do you think per capita meat production is up despite all the wonderful vegan products like yours? Are we just too committed to dominating other animals? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. I mean, we really do. I think ultimately we really have to change hearts. Um, I think the I think the only hope for humankind is for humankind to evolve into to humane beings, and I do believe there is hope. Um, meat production is you know obviously corporations have a lot of power, government subsidies, making meat inexpensive. All of this has an impact. So there's a million reasons as to why meat production is up. The average American eats 228 pounds of meat a year. Considering there are a lot of vegans and vegetarians, the number is higher. Um, in countries like China, I believe uh, the average consumption is up to 60 pounds or something like that. Um, but you know, if you go back 50 years ago, it was it was negligible. So, um, the more we have factory farms, the more it, we're going to continue to eat meat, and we do need to figure out a solution. But I, I really, I, do, I just, you know, most people think people aren't going to give up meat. There's no point. We just have to substitute the meat with impossible and, you know, don't tell them that it's impossible or whatever. <laughs> but I, I really don't believe that. I really have hope for humankind. And if you just think back 50 years ago, people used to tie up dogs in their backyard. 
People don't do that anymore. You, I mean, people sleep with their dogs now. Because we've, we've already changed in 50 years. We've changed our attitude towards dogs. So if we keep this up, if we actually talk about, if we try to reach people's hearts, I, I truly believe we can save animals. And ultimately, it's about saving us. Because do we want to be a race of people that exploits and abuses others? Or do we want to be more humane beings? So really, veganism isn't just about saving animals. It's about saving the human race. It's about our own humanity. It's about our own evolution from being savages to being humane beings. We have to believe in that. I won't give up. Here, here. Well, I have no shortage of things I want to ask you, but the audience questions are great, and I just want to know how you, um, how you think about some of these things. So here's another one. Should becoming vegan be a conscious choice, an adult mind's rational choice, or do we help our children by starting them as vegan? I think you do. So I think children are naturally compassionate. So, I mean, if you just think about it, how many children do you take to pick berries, but would you ever take them to a slaughterhouse? Would you ever take them to a place where you'd show them how to kill a chicken? You just wouldn't do that because you know that would freak the kid out. So children are already naturally compassionate, so why not nurture that in them? Why would we give them the option to eat meat if we don't need to? I mean, once again, throughout history, we didn't eat a lot of meat anyway. So why should we start that tradition? Why not start the tradition of compassion? I just want to say what I really appreciate about you, Miyoko, is that I feel like um, I feel like I feel myself as kind of a people pleaser, trying to walk a line always in veganism, and not you know like well it's okay if you you know and and we do need to find ways to talk to each other compassionately and and diplomatically. But I also really appreciate that you that you take a clear. Um, position on some things and that you you know where you stand on things because you know I don't think the wishy-washiness is helping us ultimately and so I just want to pause and say that I'm grateful for that and I'm sure some Thank other you. people here are too because we don't often get answers like that um, so the vegan meat cookbook which I see some of you have they will be out there she will be signing books one really kind of unique thing that I found in it is that you mentioned, some of the recipes mention incorporating vegan cheeses made by other companies, like follow your heart Parmesan or, you know, and I'm curious why you <laughs> include the competition in some ways into your recipes. Because I don't think you win by competing. I think you win by collaborating. Um, you know, one company isn't going to save the world. Um, it's a matter of really us working together to, uh, to change the food system. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually getting concerned that the same thing that's, hap that's happened in, in animal ag, which is about industrialized, industrialized agriculture, consolidation of power. I mean, there was a time probably all over Massachusetts, there were thousands and thousands of family farmers and they milked their, ca maybe they had, you know, 30 cows and they milked them and they put them in bottles and they delivered them to your doorstep. I mean, they did when I lived in, uh, in, Nor in NorCal growing up. And, and today, you know, they all, there is consolidators that buy their milk and set the prices. And family farmers have no autonomy anymore. They have no say in what they charge or what they make. And they're told by the consolidator what to do. It's the same thing, you know, all throughout animal agriculture. Um, and I'm, I'm a little concerned the same thing could happen in the vegan space where uh, companies just become too big. And we don't allow competition from small stakeholder farmers or producers or a little, you know, just a little mom and pop operation that just want to make bean burgers and sell them at farmers markets. Be you know, it's just going to be harder and harder for them to compete if we have consolidation of powers. Um, there's a lot of money going in from the from animal ag into a lot of these companies as well. Uh, and, you know, if we're getting into technologies that you cannot replicate in your home because you need bioreactors or something, this could lead to the same sort of consolidated food system. 
uh, centralized, consolidated food system. And that's a big concern for me, too, because for me, it's all about, it's not just about saving farm animals. It's about ending exploitation and abuse and um, giving, creating a food system that's based on justice and equity and opportunity for more and more people. Uh, it's it's about the economics as well. So, you know, I have, I can't remember what the question was because I went on my little tangent there, but... Um, Incorporating uh, the, competition the competition into some of your yeah. recipes, so, yeah. So I do that because I want to, I want to spread the love. Um, you know, so I want people to have resources. I don't want to say, you can only buy Miyoko's products and if you can't buy my product, you can't make the recipe. Too bad. Yeah. You know, that's not like... So that's why I have a whole chapter. Like, I really wanted a bigger chapter on DIY, but the publisher didn't want that. The publisher's like, you already have too many recipes in the DIY section. We want you to, you know, just, fo we want people to know, like a lot of flexitarians like don't know how to use some of these meat alternatives. I mean, vegans do, but you know, other people don't. I went yes. straight for the buffalo mozzarella. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> so yeah, no, I really, I really want, you know, I, I want more open source stuff. Uh, and that's why I write cookbooks, and that's why I still share cheese recipes. And, um, you know, in the future, I hope to do more of that. Is there, I was interested to hear you say that landing on vegan cheese was kind of a matter for you of feeling the most intimidated by doing that. Is there something beyond vegan cheese that still intimidates you? Is there, is there something that you haven't conquered yet, or a white whale, or a recipe you haven't perfected? Huh, that's a good question. I can't think of anything right now. I mean, there, there's, there's been a lot, but there's so, I mean, let's just be honest. There are so many amazing vegan chefs today mm -hmm. solving every single problem. So we have a lot more options, but even if, you know, if, if you could never have aquafaba, I don't know, meringue, and you could only eat lentils, I would still be happy. Mm -hmm. Mascarpone, that's my white whale as a vegan. I haven't found a, a mascarpone yet. So, there, challenge thrown. Yes, all right. Your way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, we've covered so much ground. There's one more question here that I'm hoping we can sneak in if it's okay. What's your feeling on focusing on vegan, whole foods, fiber-rich diets versus people who are focused on where do vegans get their protein? Protein. Oh my protein. god. I hate that word. <laughs> Seriously. Like we have this obsession with protein, you know. I was at this conference and I was put in the alt protein group. Alt protein. Yes. And the funny thing is we all decided we that the entire table of people that were making alt proteins decided that there was too much protein focus. Um but Seriously, I think, you know, we need to go back to more of a whole foods, plant-based diet. Like, we should not be a society living on uh, buying a bunch of packaged products. We really need to learn how to cook and make things out of fresh ingredients. And, I mean, just think, that's an opportunity to share with your neighbor. If you just have a bunch of packaged products, where's the pride in sharing that with your neighbor? Maybe you have a packaged product that you get, you incorporate, like like maybe you buy vegan cheese and you incorporate it into a lasagna or something like that. That's one thing. But learn to cook. That is one of the, the, the most valuable, delicious skills you can ever have. It will bring joy not only to you but to others. And I know we're all busy. We're all running around. But there's so many fast tricks like I have learned the art of making of getting dinner done in 30 minutes and you know like it's just it's it the more you do it it's like a muscle that you develop and we should all be eating a whole foods fiber rich um, plant-based diet we really should and it, sure have your you know your vegan buffalo chicken burger once in a while or whatever but like living off of packaged goods Seems really exciting at times for vegans because it's like, oh my God, I was so missing that. Mm -hmm. But there's so much better food that's fresh. So learn to cook. Uh, we've got some lightning round question okay. requests. 
What flavors are next for your cheeses or cream cheese? Well, I think we just relaunched the cinnamon raisin cream cheese, yes. which we had some problems with. We had some molding issues with that for a while. Um, so, and uh, I don't know. I'm working, I personally am working on um, uh, mold ripened cheeses. Though That's really what I missed. So really, really good ones. Um, so the blue cheese. Blues and, and camemberts. And, and, I've, and I'm working with bases that are, I've got some really high protein. Oh God, I, I made, I posted on Instagram, but I figured out how to make this stinky cheese. <laughs> and it's, it, it's uh, made out of a couple of seeds. And there's no added oils to it. It's just these two seeds, cultures, water, milk. I mean, uh, wa uh, bacteria. And the texture the, through the aging process of about a month, the proteins and the fats in these seeds break down and it just creates this velvety, rich, stinky texture. It's like incredible. I was like shocked. So I, I found this one seed, I think that just works beautifully for that. So yeah, I don't, who knows if it'll ever come to market, but at least I'm gonna enjoy it and my <laughs> friends will. Uh, that that kind of ties into another lightning round question because someone said, "Have you tried experimenting with cheeses based on anything other than cashew?" So it oh yeah, like oh yeah, okay, absolutely yeah. So I chose cashews for the company because I was trying to streamline the supply chain. But in my book, there's you know cashews are used, but so are macadamias and oats and and other things. Um, and we've been playing around with um, a couple of other seeds. Um, um, we did have an oat milk cheese. We had the slices and shreds made out of oat milk that I pulled from the marketplace because I didn't think they were up to snuff. But uh, yeah, so we definitely are expanding beyond that into more uh, to ingredients that actually have higher protein content too. In case you're interested in protein and you're not getting enough of it in your <laughs> diet. Oh, thank you for looking out for my protein count. Um, yeah, and I actually learned this from you the other day too about cashews because you know, a lot of times people just lump cashews in with all the other nuts and, and assume that cashews are as water hungry as almonds. So share with the good people what you taught me about cashews. Okay. Well, you know, they do require a lot of water, but that water comes from rainfall because cashews only grow in tropical climates. Uh, and where we source them, um, they're a wild crop. Uh, that cover vast mountaintops in Vietnam, and rainfall is the only source of water. So there, there's no water inputs at all. <laughs> um, so I just, you know, we are out of time for this portion, but I truly just want to um, genuinely thank you because, you know, I... Um, when I took the leap to going vegan, it took me a while. I did it really gradually. You know, I was vegetarian for a long time. And, you know, for desserts, I just felt like there were certain desserts that I couldn't give up. And it really took me finding products and recipes that showed me the way, that became my favorites over the, the I won't use the word dairy, the, the cow dairy options or whatever they were. And um, I'm sure you've been that for other people in the room, that you helped build, you built the world that you wanted to see and you created the products that you wanted to eat. And in doing so, you made it possible for people like me to, to choose a different path, make a different choice for myself. So thank you for that on behalf of me and probably a lot of other people here. And thank you for coming to Boston and come back anytime. I'm sure everyone here is going to want to do what I immediately did, which is like, let me tell you where you got to eat. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can tell her that too when you have your book signed that you've purchased out in the lobby uh, right after this, where there's also some delicious vegan chili. And I'm probably saving too much because Stephen, you're going to come up and tell them all this anyway. So thank you to all of you for being thank here. Thank you. And for... Yeah, having us. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. What a good conversation. And thank you all for coming. Um, I have a book to give away. Um, <gasps> oh, yeah. So the winner of our... Um, it's not a raffle. It was an automated shuffle thing that my colleagues did. Um, Sarah Giromini. Oh, I did that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> thank you for coming. And uh, just some notes. Um, 
If you weren't one of the lucky ones that just won, as Emery said, you can get a copy of Miyoko's cookbook out there. She'll sign it. And uh, we also have um, some of Miyoko's chili out there. And um, what you don't see in the booth back there are Slack messages coming in from them saying, it's really good. <laughs> So that's happening. Anyway, um, get, a, get a bite of chili. And uh, w one last note, thanks to our friends at Boston University's Food and Wine Program and also our partners at Brookline Booksmith who brought the books and arranged all that. Um, coming up next at uh, City Space here, the Northern Lights on demand with artist Dan Asher and his Borealis Lights. We're going to show some of that here. And then you can go to Kendall Square where you can see the Northern Lights above Kendall Square. <clears throat> above Kendall Square. That's with uh, Boston. Radio Boston host Tizian Deering. That's Thursday, October 6, 6.30 p.m. Tickets at wbur.org slash events. And thank you. Thank you again to Miyoko. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>